We're here with Professor Tsuneo Nishida. Professor Nishida, yoroshiku onegaishimasu. It's an honor to be speaking to you today. Professor Nishida, a man of many accomplishments and a very long and illustrious career working with the Japanese Foreign Ministry, you graduated from the University of Tokyo in 1970, and in the same year you entered the realm of Japanese Foreign Ministry, the Japanese Foreign Policy. What was it like entering this realm for the first time? Well, I think uh, when I, uh, at the time, if I remember correct, uh, I was uh, really pondering about, so uh, what is the best job to uh, really, I mean, uh, make our community, including country and others, a little bit better than, I mean, we see today. That was uh, probably so fundamental, deep, naive kind of motivation for me to choose the uh, ministry bureaucracy, and uh, at the time, very frankly, there are two top I mean, ministries. One is finance, and another one was the foreign ministry. And uh, I thought uh, Japan is, uh, in a sense, isolated island country. We need a good diplomat to really talk to and uh, work with the rest of the world. So my choice was not finance, but I mean, a diplomat. Entering that realm for the first time, what were the key challenges or issues that were surrounding Japan's national interests at the time? At the time, uh, Japan was a part of the uh, NPT or not. Because NPT is, uh, like I mean, a German case, it's a difficult challenge for every, in a sense, the uh, scientifically and politically kind of emerging or even recovering countries after Second World War. And uh, that was really not only international issues, but, I mean, the domestic issues. Japan want to be somehow the country of second class or not. I mean, at that time, the jargon was Germany and Japan, huge giant of economy, but small of political sphere. So uh, then uh, NPT at that time discussion was whether Japan was forever somehow by being a part of this NPT regime, abandoning kind of the options, otherwise open to the future of the Japanese diplomacy. You mentioned Japan wanting to be a, a second class state. I mean, the discussion was. The, the not was not was my opinion, but at that time discuss whether Japan. So if you choose this part of regime NPT, and they really abandon legally the possibility for you to be, I mean, a part of this uh, nuclear club, is it really good for Japan in the future or not? So that was the issue at the time. So, since you've been stationed or lived quite a long time in Germany, how was your experience during that particular period um, as a Japanese being in Germany? Well, at the time, of course, uh, as you really nicely remember, it's at the time of Ostpolitik. I mean, uh, the uh, for German traditionally, historically, I mean, uh, the uh, Russia has been always big element of diplomacy. When you're talking about your economy, you're talking about geography, you're talking about strategic issues, then you never forget the East neighbor that has been always Russia. And uh, as you, of course, I mean, hear from my lectures or speeches, Germany was uh, the, uh, divided into two parts, East and West. Therefore, for, I mean, uh, the Western German people at the time, including the students in the campus of Munich University, uh, where I have studied a little bit, uh, was totally divided into two parts, I mean, two schools. One is, yeah, just accept the reality, because this uh, building will never, never collapse. So we have to live on with reality, and we pursue Germany as part of Western campus. Another group, I think a little bit is probably a minority. They said, no, no, no. I mean, uh, we once, I mean, a German nation is one. So uh, probably we have to somehow accommodate the reality, but we never be allowed to declare we really admit 
why we accept division half to I mean, in Germany. As an international student during that time, and which group have you or had your affiliations with, if I might ask? To which side would you lean toward to back then? Uh, I think uh, at the time, of course, uh, as you remember, the uh, Mr. Brandt, at the time, uh, the so mayor of Berlin, and after that, I mean, he was chancellor, and uh, his and his close associate, his name was Egon Bahr, uh, these are the engines of those who somehow accommodate the uh, reality, but, uh, you know, so that, I mean, uh, West Germany could live on and enjoy the prosperity. And uh, the Conservative Party, uh, they really want, as I said, no, they really do choose the another path and keeping small, probably, or never realized, but a small open place, room, for, I mean, a German diplomacy to somehow come back to this very important national agenda. And uh, I was probably the, uh, so, somehow, I mean, of uh, stronger uh, affection to the uh, so second part. You were also, just to clarify, stationed in the Soviet Union for yeah. a while. Now, having been in East Germany and the Soviet Union, I would like to know, how was the perception of the unification of from East and West Germany in East Germany, as well as compared to the one in the Soviet Union? As well as, to clarify that a little bit more, in East Germany, the situation being so close to the border to the West Germany, the, the perception of the whole situation of unification must have been must have been quite different, I believe, from that, what has been going on actually in Moscow, being in the regime, in the kind of communist um, sphere, um, rather than being on the border. And I would like to know the differences, if you have experienced any. Yeah, in it's, case. I think, a complex part of this, uh, this issue. Because uh, German division was a product of, I mean, uh, two world wars. As I, as I shared with you, uh, in the lecture. And, uh, unfortunately, Germany have really, I mean, a big role, uh, even in two cases, both as well. And, uh, your division as a country in Germany was the really final result of this series of the world wars and, uh, associated with ideology, as you have mentioned communism and capitalism to make, I mean, very simple. And uh, therefore, I mean, uh, this uh, national kind of perspective and the global perspective are totally, totally different. And at that time, of course, I think uh, my old, many, I mean, uh, German friends also share, I think, my kind of impression that this is a sh issue of our own but we never, we never resolve by ourselves. Americans and the Russians, they, they could resolve sometime, but probably not. I mean, at the time where I really still live, that was a perception. So that sense, I think, so you are not owner of that event, end of the day, leading to the collapse of the Berlin Wall. You are just surprised and you benefited that. Thank you for that. Now, part of your career at one point, in 2010, you became the permanent representative of Japan to the United Nations for around three years, if I'm not mistaken. Three years. During those three years, what were the, hap the major happenings concerning Japan during that time when it comes to international affairs? Yeah, of course, I mean, uh, the North Korea nuclear issues has been always dominant and prevailing in my time and in my job as uh, an ambassador to United Nations. And uh, this is, in a sense, also from national perspective, priority number one, uh, no doubt about that. But uh, that was exactly the same time as we have been really working on Iran issues, uh, Iran nuclear issues, proliferation issues. And somehow analogy, or I mean a comparison studies have done between two cases. Korean Peninsula and Iran cases. That was in that sense, not only professionally, but intellectually, a very interesting time. 
And the third is, of course, uh, that was a really chaotic situation in the Middle East and Africa. And uh, during that three years, that well-known and almost forgotten, a kind of the movement that at the time named Arab Spring. We are so impressed, we are so happy to see the first phase of this Arab Spring, starting from Tunisia and others, just spreading out. And uh, at the time, some of my colleagues declared, very I many applauded that, Finally, United Nations, finally, world has reached that level. I mean, this is responsibility to protection, R2P. Uh, it's a famous kind of the ideology. Once, I mean, your government abandoned you, I mean, the people, then the world, name of the world and humanity are allowed or even should intervene into, quote, quote, domestic issues of the third country to protect the people in front of the irresponsible local countries.